sometimes it's moments of brokenness which create the greatest transformations. Times where fear gives birth to faith, pain leads to healing, and chaos dissolves into peace. It's in these times we often see God more clearly. For in our deepest turmoil, He remains faithful. When our spirit is crushed, He remains strong. When our moment is too heavy, He carries the burden. As gold is refined by fire, we too are often refined by struggle. It's part of growing, changing, becoming. Lately, the journey has been difficult. Our breath has been labored. Our steps uneasy. But we stand in faith knowing who is leading us through this desert. The God of peace, the God of hope, the God of restoration. Good morning, Victory. How are we doing? Awesome, awesome. Good morning to everybody who's here in person and to those online. A little context, I was thinking like, how do I energize people today? And I was driving here and I was thinking, I have no idea. But hey, you guys are energized already. But, word of encouragement. I was driving here thinking, God, how do I energize people? And he told me, what better thing to energize people than to knowing you're giving it all to God on a Sunday morning and you have time to worship him. And that to me was like, yo, that's dope. There's, no, there's nothing better than that. So just kicking things off with the announcements, with that little word of encouragement, the first item we'll be discussing is going to be our member meeting. October 17th, it's going to be right after Sunday service. We're going to have a very crucial, very important member meeting. If you are a member, please attend. Again, crucial. And if you don't attend, I will find you. I'll be on the lookout. But in all seriousness, please attend. Extremely important, right after Sunday service, October 17th. Next item to discuss is going to be something extremely dear to my heart. It's going to be our re revamped Young Adults Ministry. We're going to have our first service October 6th at 7.30 p.m. It's going to be located in our church offices at 520 West South Street. A little word of encouragement about that, about what we plan to do with that ministry. It's going to be a time of collaboration, a time of fellowship with people who are young adults. If you're sitting there and you're thinking, I'm a little bit on the fence about this. I know that weird announcement guy's going to be there, and I don't want that kind of energy on a Wednesday night. Believe me, I understand. I have to deal with myself all the time. But God's going to be there too, and that's a fat W. So I encourage you, please attend. Bring some friends. It's going to be a time of worship, a time of a brief message, also a time of study. Little quick reminder for the online crowd before we go on with the rest of the announcements. We are going to be doing communion today. Please gather your essentials. The Lord isn't going to be particular if you have one kind of juice or another. He loves you. He knows you're trying. So gather what you can. The second, and I apologize, fourth item to discuss is going to be to stay connected with us on social media. As always, please connect with us on Facebook and Instagram, at Lantau David. Also, please subscribe to our weekly newsletter, info at victoryanaheim.org. Now let us rise to our feet and let's worship God, guys.
beautiful song. Thank you, worship team. Go ahead and take your seats. So uh, we're going to go ahead and go to the Lord with our, our season of offering, and we invite you into this, into this expression of praise and thanks to the Lord um, for our giving. You can do, do it two ways, either through our online platform, victoryanaheim.org slash donate, uh, or you can use the giving box in the back of the room as well. And so God bless you as you give. Today we're going to observe communion. And as we prepare to observe communion, I want to uh, just set the stage for communion with you. So you can, if you want to participate in communion in a moment, you can come forward and be able to receive uh, the elements. And uh, communion is, a, is one of the two ordinances of the Christian church that we observe. There's baptism and the Lord's Supper are the two ordinances that we observe. And both are expressions of the faith that draw us to remember, that evoke images and, and, and the essence of the faith. With communion, the two elements, the drink and the bread, are to remind us of Jesus and his sacrifice. The bread reminds us of, of Jesus, his body that was broken for our sins. And the juice reminds us of his blood that was shed on our behalf. And, and so we, we invite all believers in Christ. We invite, invite all followers of Jesus to come and participate in the Lord's Supper with us. And, and uh, I'll give you a moment. If you want to participate, the elements are right here. Just come forward and, and get them yourself. Don't be shy. Just come up and get it. And um, as you're doing that, I just want to want to say a, 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 another word about taking communion. In the scriptures, we're reminded to not take of communion unworthily, and and what that what that word unworthily means in in context with with communion is, if there's anything between you and God, that separates your relationship, or if there's anything between you and another person, that separates your relationship. Then, then, then hold off on taking communion at this time. Hold off on taking communion today until you go and make that right. When you make that right, then participate in communion because communion is, is, is an act of remembrance. There's nothing magical that happens from communion, but it's an act of remembrance to remember Jesus and in the spirit and the attitude of why Jesus came to reconcile humanity to God and with each other. We want to make sure that we are reconciled with God before we take communion. We are reconciled with each other before we take communion. So with that, if you have the elements, we can partake together. There's two parts to open. Let's take the bread first. This is to remind us that Jesus died on the cross so that you might be reconciled to God, so that you might have life forever with God by the grace of Jesus. So God bless you, the body of Jesus broken for your sins. This is to remind you that his blood was shed so that you might have life eternal, so that you might be able to experience every day in the presence and the power of God and his goodness. So God bless you as you partake. Amen.
Thanks, worship team. I love that song. One of the great, long-time, meaningful hymns of the faith. His grace is amazing. So we're doing a series, and this series is called Gentle and Lowly. It's based on the book of the same title, Gentle and Lowly. If you haven't received a copy of the book, we have a copy for you. Just pick it up at the back table. Uh, there's no charge for it. It's, it's for you. We just believe this message is, is powerful and, and that you'll be blessed by it, encouraged in your faith. So pick up a copy of Gentle, Low, Gentle and Lowly uh, by Dane Orland, and I think you'll, you'll really enjoy that. We're in week five of this series, and this message, this message is called What Our Sins Evoke. And what I'm going to do is I, I want to invite you to pray with me as, as I begin this message, and um, we'll set up this message. Um, I think you'll, you'll um, this is based on chapter seven of the book, and uh, this is a powerful message that I think we all need to hear. Sinners and saints need to hear this message. It's powerful word. Will you join me as, as we pray? Our God and our Father, we are so thankful to be in your presence, Jesus. We thank you for who you are, and we thank you for what you do. We thank you, Lord, that while we rested last night, you were at work in the world, drawing people to yourself, wooing people into your presence, and inviting them to dine at your table. And Lord, I pray that as, as, as we open your word right now, I pray that you would, you would um, use these words to, to speak to our souls, to minister grace to our souls, and, and as both an invitation to your presence and as uh, a, 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 a command to go. And bring this message to a world that desperately needs it much more than it could ever realize. Thank you, Jesus, that you meet us where we are. Thank you, Jesus, that you know each person and the struggles that we're going through right now. Lord, you know how our lives are going and where we need you. You see out ahead. And Lord, I pray that we would be attuned to you so that we might be ready for what is to come. And we pray these things in Jesus' powerful name. And all God's people said, amen. amen, amen. What our sins evoke. So the word evoke is to bring or recall to the conscious mind. Every day, things are, are, are happening in your life. You experience things that evoke memories in your life. And, and, and so, so when, I, when I see pictures of, of my parents. It, it, it evokes memories of, of my parents who, who've passed. And, and, and I, I think of all kinds of memories from my childhood when I see pictures of my, pre, of my parents. There was a time after, when, after my dad died in 2017. My mom died in 2014. But after dad died, I, I, I kind of didn't want to see pictures of mom and dad for a while because every time I saw those pictures, it just made me cry. It just drew tears out of me. And I was like, I, you know what? I'm done crying. I've cried so many tears. I don't want to cry any more tears. And, and, and um, thank God I'm over that. But, but images can evoke memories in your, in your mind. And, you know, recently I was driving down Knott Avenue in Buena Park. And, um, and I was driving past Peak Park. And they had the signs up for Silverado Days. And seeing that sign for Silverado Days in Buena Park, if I grew up in Buena Park and, and since I was a little boy, and, 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 and it evoked um, memories of Silverado Days. And I remember the, the, the fun, like every kid in the school went to, to, to Silverado Days. Every single kid was at Silverado Days. I went to, to Raymond Temple Elementary School in Buena Park, and, and just every kid was, was at Silverado Days. And you would see all your friends there, and, and your parents would, 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 would give you some money to go buy tickets for all the rides, and you'd buy the tickets and get on, on all these, these um, carnival rides. And, you know, I, 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 we were there as kids without our parents and just running all over the place and just having a great time. Always such great memories that that... that, that evokes of me when Silverado Days comes around. 
And you have so, sometimes it'll be a smell that evokes a memory or a place, being somewhere that evokes memories and you, and you, you do things, it, it, it draws something out of you. That memory, those emotions that, if, that, that things can evoke from you were already there even if they weren't in your conscious mind. They were there and something triggers those, those emotions and those memories. And uh, in this message, we're going to look at, at something that's very powerful. It's, it's what our sins evoke in the heart of God. And this is from the book of Hosea, which, which is one of the, 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 in the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament, and Hosea was a prophet. And the book of Hosea was written in the 7th century B.C., over 700 years before Christ came, the book of Hosea was written. It was written by a prophet of the same name. The imagery throughout the, the 14 chapters of the book of Hosea, it uses metaphors of family to depict the relationship of, of God and his people. So the first few chapters, we see this, this, uh, the, the, the imagery of a husband and wife, and, and God's people are depicted as an unfaithful wife that cheats on her husband, and, 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 and God is, is, is the husband that is, is, is longing for his wife. And then, and then it goes on, and it talks about, uses the imagery of, of, of the, the parent-child relationship. And that's what we see here in chapter 11 that we're going to look at. We're going to look at Hosea chapter 11, verses 1 through 8. And I'm going to spend the next few minutes bringing out some, some, some imagery, some meaning from these scriptures about what our sins evoke. And, and so I'll, I'll begin with, with verses 1 through 3. And this, this part of the message I call beginnings. Beginnings of a relationship with God. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burnt offerings to the idols. Yet, it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. In verse 1 is this, this enduring look at the way God views his people as a father and child. The Lord always sees his people as family. When you are a child of God, when you are a follower of God, the Lord embraces you as family. And at the heart of the relationship, he works for the well-being of his children. A quick history lesson about Israel. It says, I called my son out of Egypt. When Israel was in Egypt, hundreds of years before this, before this time, it started out as a beautiful thing. Joseph, the son of Jacob, also known as Israel, was, had, be, had ascended to the second in charge of the entire nation of Egypt, which was at that time the most powerful nation on the world, in the world. And, and Joseph brought his family into Egypt because there was a famine far and wide. And to save the lives of his family, where he could care and look after them, he invited them to live in Egypt. And they did so. And it was beautiful. And the, the Egyptian people welcomed the Israeli people with open arms on that day. And, and, and then over time, the, the Israelis, they grew in number. They multiplied in number. And, and the Egyptians were threatened by the newcomers, by how rapidly their numbers grew. And they thought, they'll become more powerful than us, and they'll take our nation from us. And, and so they created a national policy that, that every person of Jewish descent the different people, the foreigners, would become slaves. And it was so for hundreds of years. An entire 
ethnic group became slaves because of their ethnicity. And, and, and so uh, it created this, this, this two-tiered society of the Egyptians and the, and the, the Jewish people who were the slaves and the, the Egyptians who were their masters. And so after 400 years in Egypt, God called his son, his child, out of Egypt, and that's what it, this, this alludes to. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. And, and Egypt w- or, um, uh, Israel was led by Moses out of slavery and, and, and to their, their own land that the Lord had prepared for them. And, and this season was, in history, one of the greatest mass migrations that had ever happened. Over two million people migrated out of Egypt into a new land and birthed a new country. And the Lord led his people to a new land where they could grow and thrive. In verse 2, it talks about this, this terrible trait in, 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 that we see in, in human beings. It's a terrible trait that when we take for granted those who are most responsible for our well-being, it says in verse 2, the more they were called, the more they went away. And, and, and so the prophet is, is, is speaking about how Israel would sacrifice to these other gods. It says sacrificing to the Baals. It, it, it's referring to other gods. And speaking to the people of worshiping these other gods of the neighboring countries. As it happened in, in all of, or as it happens in all of history, we see this propensity of, of every people group that are drawn to worship something, some God. Every country, every people, they always worship something, some God, some religion, some something. And, and we see that over and over, even in our day. Because it's part of human nature that we long to, for the transcendent and we find things that, that sort of scratch that itch. But many of the things we find are false gods. And, and so religious expressions always manifest and become part of every culture. I have, when thinking about this idea of the, this terrible trait that we take for granted, those who are most responsible for our well-being. I have spoken with far too many Christian mothers speaking about their children, their adult children, and weeping and mourning over their adult children who have wandered from the path, who have wandered away from God in their adulthood. And, and parents, especially mothers, who, who, who pray for their children to come back to God, who beg the Lord to have mercy on their children. And they've wandered far from the, the Father's caring, ha- caring hands. Now, in this second part of the message, in, in verse 4, I call kindness. It's about the Lord's kindness on His people. So, starting with, with verse, with verse 4... Um, I, I, I'm actually going to read verse 3 and 4 real quick because they go together. And so I'm only, but here, here I go. So verse 3, I'm going to remind you what it says. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them by their arms, but they did not know that I had healed them. Verse 4, I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws. And I bent down to them and fed them. Here in, in verses 3 and 4, we, we, we see this, these beautiful words to describe the father who took care of his child in every way. He taught them to walk. He took them in his arms, brought cords of kindness, bands of love, the one who erases the yoke on their jaws. Remember what we talked about yoke as part of in earlier in this series, a yoke was, is what is u- was used uh, for the cattle that, 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 that um, a, a, an instrument to force them, the cattle to do the labor. And it, it's a painful thing. It's something that, that it's, uh, it talks about forced labor. And it says, it says, I took, I took, I was the one who erases the yoke on their jaws and he bent down to them and fed them. Such care and some ca- some, such compassion that we see from the heart of God for his people. 
That's what this, this, these words evoke. The kindness of God is expressed in, in so many ways in our lives. And if we have the eyes to see and the hearts to receive it, we'll see God's kindness all around us in our lives. And, and, and yet, in verse 3, it says, they did not know who had healed them. They did not know. I have a question for you, for you, right here. The question is this. Do you know who healed you? Do you know who healed you? Can you recognize the Father's hands that have taught you to walk and that have raised you up? Do you know the Father who has long pursued you and cultivated good things in your life? He has brought cords of kindness. He's brought bands of love all the days of your life. Do you recognize it? And, and, and as we move on, this third section, verses 5 through 7, I call rejection. Verses 5 through 7, it says, They shall not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria shall be their king. Again, we're reading from verses 5 through 7. They shall not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria shall long be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword shall rage against their cities, consume the bars of their gates, and devour them because of their own counsels. Verse 7, my people are bent on turning away from me. And though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. Because God's people rejected him, he will reject them. And this is a word of prophecy that was written to Israel. Before the fall of the northern nation of Israel, when the, when the country was divided in two, the northern part of Israel, this was specifically to them, not to the southern part of Israel, because they were on track to follow God, but the north was not. And so this word of prophecy was to, the northern, to northern Israel before the Assyrian Empire invaded and conquered their land. It was their last chance to turn back from back to God before their fall. Now, briefly, I want to talk about nations because if you don't understand this about God, the Lord definitely throughout history, we see in the scriptures, works through nations and in the, 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 the experience of nations over and over again. So I want to talk very briefly about America. Let's talk about American history. America was a nation founded with Judeo-Christian beliefs and principles of faith, liberty, personal responsibility, and covenant. The idea of covenant is all over America. And, and so we have this, this covenant with our government that, that we will elect them and send them to represent us to Washington. That's a covenant that is rooted in biblical covenants, promises, uh, transactions between, like, between God and his people. Well, we have the covenant is all over American society that are between the government and the people. And, and America has always been a nation committed to having no national religion. Though it was founded on Judeo-Christian beliefs, the Judeo-Christian believers never wanted to force any religion on anyone. And that has been, from America's founding, an important principle. And, and, and so where, where people would be free to choose their own religion, any religion they, choose, they, they want, or no religion at all. However, in the, in the national ethos, you could see the basis for a nation established on these historic Judeo-Christian foundations. So you can see it all around you if you look for it. Even though we don't have a national religion, you can see the Judeo-Christian foundations all around you in our country if you have the eyes to see. So if you pull out a dollar 
from your pocket, from your wallet, from your purse. You will see the words that say, in who we trust? In God we trust. It's on every American piece of money. And it was a reminder that we put our trust in, in God and never in government. The, the, the founders wanted us to have this as part of, 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 our, of, our, of our national ethos, that we would remember every time we spent money, if we, if we bothered to look at it, that we would see. Don't trust in the government who printed this money. Trust in God. And, and, then, and then we see it in the Pledge of Allegiance. One nation under who? A nation under God. Can you, can you see the glimpses of the Judeo-Christian ethos, foundations all over our nation? And then, and then the Declaration of, of Independence, these powerful words that, that, that we are endowed by their who? Their creator with certain unalienable rights. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Who are we endowed with those rights by? By our creator. Not by our government. Our government has no ability to give the rights to pursue happiness. Liberty, which is freedom. The government doesn't give these things. These are God-given rights. Governments try to take them away and do take them away. That's why the founders wanted to remind us not to put our trust in government. And, and then even further, the declaration closes with these words. And for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence... We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And then they signed it. Each one of them signed it. But in recent years, America has drifted far from her roots. And today, a dominant force is pushing and pillaging its way to take over all public institutions, all political entities, and even the hearts of every person in America, every American and would-be American. This force, I will call it secular liberalism. That's the force. Secular liberalism. And we are falling apart from within. Something that has risen from within our country, secular liberalism, is, 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 is ch trying to fundamentally change America from what it was to something that it has not been ever. And, and, and so we are witnessing the decline of what was once the most powerful national force for good that ever existed in the world. We're witnessing the decline of it right before our eyes. And secular liberalism rose from the inside of the country and is replacing faith and trust in God with faith and trust in the government and the experts. The technocrats. The, the, the nation is becoming a technocratic society, which means that we look to the, 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 this is a secular religion, by the way. This is just as much a religion. Secular liberalism is as much a religion as Islam, Christianity, or Judaism. Secular liberalism is a religion. And this religion even has its own priests. All of the experts that they, that they, they prop up to tell us what to do are the technocratic experts that they're telling us to listen to and obey, to comply with. So what the experts say, we listen to and fall on our knees and do what they say. Everything the experts tell us to do, 
Whether those experts are the politicians that view themselves as sort of like royalty, like it's their right to have this place of privilege of being our rulers, whether it's the, in the media or the educators in the medical industry, we are experiencing medical tyranny in front of our faces. And it's a real thing. This secular liberalism is a religion in its own right that's seeking to replace God with human structures. So calling on the American people and demanding that the American people bow to the technocrats, bow to the government. It's just as much as when Nebuchadnezzar was before God's people and said, bow before my image. And if you don't, you'll be thrown into the fire. And, and Daniel's three friends, they refused to bow before the image of the government. They refused to bow before the image of the government that the government placed before them. And for, for, for refusing to comply with the government orders, they were thrown in fire. And the Lord saved them. So America is like Israel. Unfaithful to our God. We've turned our back on our God. And the, the, the father of all, we are worshiping another God. Our dollars still saying, God, we trust, but no. The government is saying, trust in us. And secular liberalism in its own brand of religion with its own priests and experts is demanding that we bow. And God's people have just as much a choice today as did Daniel and his three friends. Like ancient Israel, America has turned from God, the God who rescued and nurtured us. He taught us to walk. He took us in his arms with cords of kindness and bands of love. He took every yoke of bondage away from us. He bent down and fed us when we could not feed ourselves. And yet, we do not know who healed us. He nurtured us. He taught us. He empowered us. And we are still rejecting him for another God, a much lesser God. The last part I call emotions because we get a glimpse into the God who has been rejected. This is the punchline of this message. Verse 8, the, this is the Lord speaking. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? Ephraim is one of the names in, in, in the scriptures for Israel. It was one of the tribes, one of the largest tribes of Israel. And, and so Israel was often referred to as Ephraim. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm. And tender. What is the response of God to his people rejecting him, to his people turning to their sin? What is the response of God? How can I turn you over? How can I punish you? My heart grows warm and tender. It recoils within me with compassion for you. Parents, some of you know the emotional conundrum of being so angry and disappointed with your child. You, you, they need to be punished for their behavior. They need to be punished for how badly they behaved. And, and, and yet, when it comes time to punish them, when they're repentant and they're, they're, they're sorrowful and they look at you with those eyes and... And then you just want to love your child and embrace your child. And you know the conundrum because you need to teach them what's right. 
So they need to experience punishment, but you want to love them and prop them up. And, and, and the emotions of God for his people are kindled by our sins. Do you get that? When we sin, God's response is compassion for us, tenderness, and a warm heart. When we fall away, when we fail, when we disappoint God, he wants to lift us up and embrace us and restore us. That's the heart of God for his people. The emotions of God run deep. The compassion runs deep. The heart of God lights up with compassion because of our sin. He reaches out and he wants to heal us, to restore us, to redeem us. That's what God wants for his people. When you sin, when you fail, when you fall from grace, don't let the enemy lead you down the dark road that tells you there's no way back to God. Because God is waiting for you to turn around. The scripture tells us the Lord gets warm and tender about his children when we sin. The Lord declares, how can I give them up? How can I hand them over? How can I treat them badly? They are my children. My heart is alive for them. My compassion is warm and tender for them. My love is waiting for them. So this scripture is a call to return to God. To walk in a way that is good and right and true. You're meant for it and born for it. In the name of Jesus, return to God. And as for our, where our country goes, that's not in our hands. But I think our actions today can have an influence on it. And I pray that we would be people who worship the one who healed us, who remember who healed us, remember who propped us up, remember that God was always for us and never against us. And he's ready to restore us, receive us, empower us, embrace us. So I just want to give you a, an opportunity to respond in the name of Jesus right now to this message. I want to draw to a point of prayer, if you'll join me. Just close your eyes. Just allow for the next moments to be able to respond to God. Because the Lord may be speaking to you about something in your life, about the posture of how you're living, about decisions that you're making. And, 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 and the, for sure the message is, turn back to God. But it's also, let go of what's holding you back. Let go of the lesser gods, be they secular gods or anything else. Return to God. And so, it, in response, I just want to lead you through a prayer. If some of you want to be led into a prayer of putting your faith and trust in God, it's always an important aspect of the Christian faith. Some of you might say, you know, I haven't yet put my faith in God, but I want to. And I, I just want to invite you to pray a simple prayer to Jesus. It says, Jesus, I give you my life. I want to seek you and follow you. So I give you my life. And that is an invitation for Jesus to be your Lord, your leader. Your God. May you follow him from this day forward. May you walk in his grace, never again turning away from the path of righteousness, but only walking toward God in his goodness and invitation to you. And some of you may go, well, you know what? I have been one that departed from what I know is right. My parents have shed tears over me. But I want, I want to put my faith back in Jesus today. And you can do so. You can walk on the path by the same prayer. Jesus, today I give you my life afresh, anew, from this day forward to walk in your goodness and your grace and your love. So God bless you. I invite you to 
sing with us in worship. Will you rise to your feet?
beautiful, beautiful. It's been so good to be together as God's people. And as we close out this service, we're going to sing one more song. And um, I just want to say a couple of things. If there's anyone out there, either online or in person, that did put their faith in Jesus, please let us know because we want to journey with you. Um, We want to come alongside you in your faith journey as you follow God. We want to help you take those first steps of faith or those next steps of, of following God. So send us an email to victory, or info at victoryanaheim.org. Um, let us know you put your faith in Jesus or you want to begin following the Lord and so we can start journeying with you. Uh, as, we, as we close out the service, I want to give you this blessing that you are the light of the world. God has destined that he use his people to bring light into dark places. The world is a dark place filled with evil. And yet there are always glimpses of his goodness. Because every one of us is created and born in his image. So may we be instruments that prod along goodness in the name of Jesus in this world. In our workplaces, in our schools, in our neighborhoods, in our families. May we bring light. So go in peace as his light. And join us as we sing once more, our God.